What a Grand Prix that was. Max Verstappen converted another pole to a win, Lando Norris surprised himself by coming home in P2, and Sergio Perez rounded out the podium places. But aside from the top three, it was a race full of incidents, overtakes, and some off-track drama as a result. We'll debrief it all in just a moment. Welcome to the latest in the F1 World podcast. I'm Lucy. And I'm Dan. Bringing you analysis of the latest in the F1 world. Let's review the Chinese Grand Prix. So let's start with the top three before we get into the rest of the race and obviously the numerous incidents that we had today. Uh, Max Verstappen was in P1 once again, Sergio Perez in P3 and Lando Norris in P2. Let's start with Red Bull though. Obviously, it was an incredible day for them once again. Max had a lead of over 13 seconds by the end of the race. And bear in mind, we also had safety cars. Um, he held the lead despite the VSC and the safety cars. And it was just another dominant day for him, really. But despite him obviously dominating the field, he was pushing quite a lot. And I think at the end, he said that he was trying to drift the F1 car um, just for a bit of fun, just to himself, because he had such a big lead. Um so yeah, how do you rate his weekend? How do you rate Sergio's weekend? Obviously, they'll be happy leaving China. How's it going to look for them heading into Miami as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it's you can't rate it anything but highly. Obviously, Sergio Perez probably would have liked to have had P2. Um, but Lando Norris was surprised with his own pace. Um, he wasn't expecting to be faster than the Ferraris um, and yet brought it home in P2. Um, so I don't think Sergio really could have had that position. Um, but yeah, again, obviously they have to be completely happy with that. P1 and P3 is not a bad weekend at all, not a bad result to be going into Miami with. Um, obviously last year was kind of where Sergio lost his confidence in Miami with the car after he got overtaken, he got lapped by Max. Um, so hopefully we don't see another um, incident like that again for him because I think that kind of knocked his confidence for the rest of the season. Um, but it'll be interesting if we do to see if he can recover from that. And yeah, I think uh, obviously they're going into the weekend with a very positive attitude. Yeah, definitely. I think maybe last year at this point, five races in, he was still kind of going after the world championship. And this year he's, I think he's resigned to that and he's decided I'm just going to try and be the best uh, second driver that I can be rather than trying to battle Max for the championship. I think that's the big difference is that he's now focusing on his own race yeah. rather than focusing on how far away he is from Max. Exactly. And if he looking at setups and stuff, he's not trying to adapt Max's setup to be as fast as possible. He's working on his own things to be as fast as he can be. We saw that not perhaps work for him a little bit this weekend. He struggled with pace quite a lot, I think, on Saturday and for balance as well. And then they made some changes in that second, in the break of Park Ferme between the sprint and quality. Um, so just a little bit, I say an off weekend, but for him to be P3, that's an incredible weekend for him as well, considering last year a bad weekend was like a P12 or a P15, you know? Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. This year, this is exactly where he needs to be up the top end of the field. Um, you mentioned that Lando had surprised himself with his podium finish, um, but I was surprised at how good McLaren were, just generally speaking. I think they undersold themselves coming into the weekend quite a lot and Lando especially Oscar had a bit of a mixed weekend but Lando was very strong obviously he took pole for the sprint quali he was p6 in the sprint p4 in uh, Grand Prix qualifying and then obviously p2 in the race today um, do you think the changing conditions maybe helped the McLaren today or over the weekend because we obviously had those cooler temperatures and the wet weather and today was uh, warmer but dry yeah I think it's quite interesting really because I feel like last year the McLaren was very weather dependent. It only liked certain types of weather. Whereas this year, obviously, this weekend we've seen a whole range of seasons throughout one weekend. Yeah. And the McLaren's performed quite well throughout them, throughout all of them. Um, I think we didn't really get to see Lando's full potential in the sprint race. Because obviously he kind of got pushed wide at the start um, with Lewis. And I think obviously he, he kind of got caught up in dirty air and stuff then and couldn't really show his full potential. So he probably had this pace throughout the whole weekend, but just wasn't able to show it until today. The whole track specificity, perhaps, of this performance for McLaren, like, yes, they've been strong so far this year, but this has been their best performance, or Lando's best performance um, anyway. But interesting because they'd struggled with long corners. We know that Shanghai has a lot of long corners. It's majority slow corners, whereas and that's quite similar to Australia. And they struggled quite a bit in Australia in that portion of the track, but then made up the time in the fast straights and the sweeping corners that they have at Albert Park. But this week, that didn't seem to hamper their performance at all, um, which I think is interesting. And perhaps a limitation of their car that under these weather conditions isn't such a problem for them. Obviously, it was warmer in Australia than this weekend. So maybe there's a bit of a combination thing going on there. Yeah, definitely. OK, so while we're on McLaren, let's talk about Oscar Piastri as well. He finished P8 in the race today, which is not bad. He gained some points, but he had had a bit of a tricky weekend and a little bit of damage in today's race. 
yeah, obviously we won't go too much into the incident that caused Piastri's damage just yet, but he did kind of get caught up in a little bit of that, which got him a bit of damage on his diffuser. And obviously that's such a vi uh, vital part of these cars in this regulation that I think he probably just struggled to generate as much downforce as he was before. Um, and obviously struggled from there. Um, but I mean, I think he did well despite that. Obviously P8 is not a bad finish considering pretty much floor damage. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's not quite the same performance as Lando, but we know Oscar's capable of it in the right conditions. So I think there's nothing he should be too worried about. Yeah. We, do you think that McLaren was stronger this week, obviously because of the conditions and the circumstances like we spoke about, but do you think they were able to capitalise on the fact that the Ferraris were poorer than they were expecting? Yeah, I was thinking about that myself because was it really McLaren being good or was it just Ferrari being worse? Yeah. But I don't think Ferrari was that bad. I think the McLaren just seemed to be in the right kind of... Um, like the optimal performance range yeah. and I think they were able to to optimise the car because of that um, yeah I think it'll be interesting to see how they go next week as well they're bringing upgrades to Miami um, Andrea Stella their team principal did say that did confirm that in an interview um, so whether they're able to kind of further and close to further close that gap to Red Bull in front of them will be will be interesting to see obviously it probably won't be in Miami it'll take them a little bit longer to, mm. to get those upgrades sorted out but um, yeah I don't think it was so much the Ferraris being bad, I think they did genuinely have quite a good weekend, so they should be happy with that. I don't think it was actually that bad of a weekend for Ferrari. If you look on paper, Charles finished fourth uh, today and Carlos Sainz was fifth. They just had a bit of a struggle for pace, which we've not really seen so far this year because they've been so strong. Um, you know, we, they were strong in Melbourne. That was another front-limited circuit, but I think the, the weird grip in Shanghai was perhaps playing a role for them. Um, yeah, Charles said that the performance on his hard tyre was just strange and that meant that he couldn't challenge Lando for that podium position, the last podium place at that point. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Obviously, um, Shanghai had the resurfacing and they sort of put a lot of grip down and then we had all that rain on Friday, which washed off that whole session's worth of grip. So there was a little bit of time for the, the um, track to rubber up a bit more, but obviously the grip's not going to be as good as it could have been. You could really see as the weekend went on that there was a distinct line forming on that new surface where the drivers were using certain parts of the track more and therefore going off the track was more costly because obviously it was dirtier. Um, we saw that happen to Carlos at the very start of the Grand Prix, got pushed wide by Charles, which he said then cost them a lot. And I think that was a bit of a theme for Ferrari over the weekend, was a little bit of inter-teammate battles. I feel like maybe they're the relation, I don't think it's that deep really, but I think the relationships may be a little bit conflicted, especially this weekend. Maybe a display of the switch of power if you want to read into it too much. Yeah, I think it might be a little bit to do with Carlos trying to prove himself for yeah. on the driver market. And he's obviously pushing a little bit harder than Leclerc is because he's secure. It, it does feel like you're reading into it a little bit much kind of thing. Yeah. Not you specifically, but like we're reading into yeah, it a bit yeah, much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I get what you mean. It's like Carlos is willing to go deeper into a corner just to really get that result sorted kind yeah. of thing so it, yeah I don't know yeah yeah definitely I just I felt like this weekend that reached a bit of a point that it hadn't reached so far you know we had them fighting a little bit over the radio as well about that and I think Charles said that they discussed it and it was all fine but then Carlos contradicted that and said we haven't had a chance to discuss it because the weekend's been so busy so I'm not really sure what's going on there it's just different messages to the media I think um yeah I don't think there's any there's going to be any problems in their relationship no, they have I'm not such a good that, chemistry no. as teammates yeah um that, yeah, I think they'll just talk it over and uh, that'll be that. Definitely. So on to Aston Martin. It was a bit of a penalty-filled weekend for them. Um, but performance-wise, not too bad, particularly for Alonso. He was P3 on the grid for the sprint, but he DNF'd after contact with Carlos Sainz. And he also received a penalty for this. He had 10 seconds added to his time after the sprint for causing a collision. And he also received three penalty points for that. Um, how do you feel about that penalty that he received there? Do you think that was too harsh? That was a good point of racing, I think, in the sprint. And ultimately, he, he got punished for it. Yeah, it was a bit odd. It seemed more of a racing incident to me than sort of a, like a than something that required a penalty. Um, I mean, you could barely even really see the contact on the TV feed. I'm sure it was probably um, a lot more dramatic for them in the cars, but I, it just seems a bit odd to me that a 10 second penalty for such a small bit of contact, um, where Alonso obviously had a pen, obviously had a puncture from it anyway, is that not sort of does that not ruin his race enough? Does he really need another 10 seconds on top of that? Um, yeah, I think there was something weird going on with the penalties this weekend. Um, it seemed to be a little bit 
too consistent in some ways and inconsistent in others. Um, yeah, it's just a bit odd. We'll come on to all of the incidents and the penalties that happened this weekend in a minute, but I just think it just wasn't... That was one of the best bits of racing that we had during that sprint was that whole battle for kind of P3, P4 between Alonso, Charles, Carlos and Perez. And yes, there was contact, but neither driver really... Obviously, Alonso DNF'd ultimately because of it, but that's the consequence of his actions then. You know, like as you said, he doesn't then need a penalty for it. And I think for me, the harshest point... Part of that, the 10 seconds doesn't make a difference who DNF'd, you know. But the three penalty points, I think that that was a level above what we've seen given to other drivers this weekend and perhaps as well for the rest of the year and last season as well. Exactly. Three penalty points for that is just completely... Exactly. In an allowance of 12 over a year. Yeah, exactly. Like That's a quarter of your penalty points gone for a tiny little tap that you suffered from anyway. Something's not... Yeah, something's weird about that. So we'll come on to penalties, as I said, in a minute, but let's just quickly cover Aston Martin's protest. So during the sprint qualifying race, we saw Carlos Sainz touch the gravel on the last corner and he spun round and hit the tyre barrier on the other side of the track. Ultimately, he was able to get the car going again. I think the stewards report said it took him like a minute 17 to get the car going again. So not too long, but that was that was long enough to bring out a red flag. Um, and as a result of that red flag, Carlos was able to get the car going again and brought it back into the pits and was able to change his front wing and then was able to set a time that knocked uh, Lance Stroll out from uh, reaching SQ3. So they protested this with the FIA. Ultimately, that protest was then dismissed by the FIA. But do you think that was a fair moment? Do you think Carlos should have been able to rejoin during the red flag or do you think he should have been out? It's definitely a bit of a difficult one, I think, for the stewards. And we've seen it before in Monaco when... Uh, I think it was Charles. Was it Charles? Cl- yeah, Charles Clerk crashed into the barrier, but subsequently kept his um, Q3 mm. time, and nobody else was able to set a time because of this. And yeah. He had pole position. It's a similar situation to that. Obviously, it's hard luck on Stroll that he was knocked out of Q3. Um, yeah, it's a tough one because obviously, if you've stopped on the track and you bring out a red flag, that stops other people from doing their laps. But then you also kind of risk the fact that you've got to go back to the pits and get any damage fixed before you can set another lap yourself. So I feel like it's kind of, again, similar thing with the Alonso penalty. You've kind of paid the penalty and the damage you receive yourself. Do you really need anything on top of that? So I think it was probably right for the stewards to dismiss it. Um, but yeah, again, a very, very difficult, one of these, another one of these situations where the rule book seems to kind of have a bit of a grey area like how do you how do you rule on that definitely yeah and that grey area is something that stewards acknowledged in their report they said that the teams have tried to agree on what being stopped on track means before perhaps in terms of a time limit and they just couldn't reach an agreement so ultimately now it's been left to the race director's discretion to decide when a car should be allowed to rejoin and when a car hasn't now i'm assuming they cleared that uh ferrari cleared that with the race director before they let Carlos back out so They were probably clear on what they were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do. Um, But I think Aston Martin were perhaps trying to kind of play on the ambiguity of the way that rule's written. It's intended to not allow a car to rejoin after they've been uh, helped by marshals or been helped by a recovery vehicle. But obviously that wasn't the case here. He was able to get going off his own back. So um, I think fair that he was allowed to rejoin. I think it was probably right that the protest was dismissed. I think, yeah, in in Aston Martin's defence... I feel like as a team, you would try and argue against that. Yeah, of why course. not? But also, I think you say, was it 1 minute 17 he was stopped on track? Mm. That does seem a little bit excessive to me. And I think maybe the rule needs to go along, more along the lines of if the car is touched by a marshal, maybe. And then it's a little bit more black and white. Was it touched mm. by the marshal? Yes. Okay, then he's not allowed to start the session again. Or not, he got it going on his own. Um, then he should be able to carry on. But yeah, 1 minute 17... Like, that's a quite a long time to be stopped in the middle of the track. And obviously, rightfully so, they red flagged it. But, yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe I want to change my mind about whether that was fair because that's a yeah. long time to be stopped on track. Yeah, and they in that time as well, they threw the red flag, which is fair enough because it's out of the last corner on the main straight. Obviously, safety comes first. But then, in contrast to that, today we saw Valtteri Bottas retire during the Grand Prix and there was double-waved yellows in sectors two and three and no look of a safety car or a virtual safety car for several laps. And he was stood directly in the runoff, getting out of his car exactly. with cars basically going full pelt down 
the bit behind him. So It's the same argument of consistency, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Consistency and communication, there just doesn't seem to be much of that at the moment. It seems... And that's not not necessarily the steward's fault. It's perhaps the regulation's fault. There's too many words in there that could be interpreted in far too many ways. And therefore, perhaps the steward's teams that are varying race to race means we're seeing different applications of those same regulations race to race. Yeah, but it also does come down just to the complex nature of the sport. There's yeah. so many ways that, you know, you could take a corner. There's so many ways for the car to break that it's almost impossible to cover all these scenarios and that's why you need such a good stewards team and maybe consistency throughout the stewards team. But yeah. then you have problems with bias and like people yeah. disliking things more than others. And yeah, it's it's almost impossible really to fully regulate, isn't it? OK, so I think that leads us on nicely to be talking about penalties and incidents that we had this weekend, particularly today in the Grand Prix. There were several. I think we'll start with the perhaps main one and perhaps the most controversial post-race, which was the Daniel Ricciardo and Lance Stroll incident on the safety car restart. So just quickly to describe what happened, we had the safety car uh, and into the turn 14 hairpin of the restart, Max had gained control to be able to do the restart instead of the safety car. And he, I think, at the front slowed slightly and that then had a bit of an effect on cars ahead slowing. Um and everyone else followed that and slowed down subsequently, except for Lance Stroll, who was looking to the apex rather than the car in front of him, looking at Daniel. You can see that on his onboard. Um, and therefore, he re rear-ended Daniel, just completely didn't break, it looked like. And this caused significant damage then to Daniel's uh, diffuser and floor, a huge loss of downforce. Daniel tried to do the restart and just dropped like a stone through the order, so he was forced to retire with that damage. As a result of this, Lance Stroll was able to carry on for the rest of the race, but he was given a 10 second penalty, uh, which he served during the race, during a stop. Um, but he ended the race in P15, which wasn't last on track despite this, given two penalty points by the stewards. What did you make of this incident? Do you think that penalty is fair considering? And again, the post-race stuff, let's maybe touch on that a bit as well, the reaction to that incident. Yeah, I think it's just really, really poor from Stroll, to be honest. You can see quite clearly from the onboard that he's not looking at the car in front of him. It's not like, I mean, it might be different from within the car, but it doesn't look like the braking was that unnatural. Obviously, you kind of had, I think it was Carlos that had a big braking moment a bit further ahead. And obviously that's going to pass back down the line, but it's going to get smaller and smaller down the, to, towards the end of the line. And they were quite far back within the pack. Mm -hmm. Um so it didn't really look that unnatural and there was quite a big gap between Lance and Daniel. Looked like time enough to sort of hit on the brakes, but obviously he was a bit too late doing it. And my other question is, why was he going so fast? Like there, was, yeah. there wasn't a big gap and he managed to build up quite a lot of speed to the fact to the point where his front nose goes under the back of Daniel Rick's car and he gets flicked up quite high. Yeah, I think it's just, it's poor from Stroll written all over it really. Um, I think there needs to be questions raised about the penalty that Stroll was given as well for this because that completely ended Daniel Ricciardo's race. It gave Oscar damage. And I think there were a couple of other incidents throughout the race as well where he caused damage to other drivers and what he gets a 10 second penalty. I just don't think that's reasonable. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. The penalty he was given was the same that Alonso was given for his incident with Carlos Sainz in the sprint race that ended Alonso's race. He was given a 10 second penalty and three points. So yes, it's one point more, but you could argue that that is basically the same penalty. Um, also post-race, we saw Lance Stroll saying that it was more of a concertina effect, that he would have liked to see the stewards take into consideration a little bit more instead of attributing 100% of the blame to him. And he called it a racing incident, saying he just didn't understand it. And I think that is a massive contrast to the reaction post-race we saw for Daniel Ricciardo, who was understandably furious about this incident. It had ended his race and he'd been looking promising all weekend. He was on to get points. And there's a lot on the line for him at the moment in terms of A, keeping that RB seat, arguably, and B, potentially, you know, there's that promotion to Red Bull that's an opportunity for those RB drivers as well. So he's fighting for two things there and he's been in desperate need of getting a points finish. And today that looked like that was about to happen for him, um, especially after his fantastic middle stint on those mediums. So I can understand why he was so frustrated after the race. And I think perhaps hearing that Lance had attributed the blame to Daniel obviously fueled that more for Daniel. And I think and I think it just wasn't Lance's greatest moment that then caught Daniel 
on an already kind of promising day that then crumbled because of that incident. I think there's a level of accountability that Stroll needs to take for that incident as well. I mean, obviously he's trying to blame it on a racing incident, but I think it was quite obviously his fault. And I think everybody, from what I've seen as well, feels that way. And I mean, everybody makes mistakes. Drivers make mistakes all the time. I think you just need to own up to it at some kind of point rather than causing this awkward tension between himself and Daniel Ricciardo now. Um, and I know it's not necessarily about awkward tension and all that, but it's just like, just take some responsibility for it, really. Like, it's you've unnecessary, done it. isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Don't try and blame it on this, that, and the other. Own up for it. Apologize. You've ruined someone else's race. Let's have some better sportsmanship within the sport. Definitely. And I think. The positive to take from this, if there is one to take from it for Daniel, is that he was having such a good weekend. He obviously had that new chassis, which perhaps was a bit of a placebo effect on his confidence and it wouldn't have actually made that much difference to his race and it wouldn't have actually made that much difference to his performance, I don't think. The team obviously had checked his old chassis and they hadn't found any problem with it, but they wanted obviously to cover all the bases in terms of helping Daniel get better performance. But I think perhaps in him becoming so frustrated and so angry post-race about this we've seen that hunger come back he wants to be doing well he knows he's got the equipment now to be doing well um and he didn't like today that that got taken away from him by something that was ultimately so far out of his control but I think that that can only be a good thing going forward and that will help him going into Miami the other thing about Miami though is that he's got that grid penalty can you explain a little bit about that grid penalty because I think that'll be the icing on the cake for his frustrating day yeah, so after the race, Daniel was given a three-place grid drop for the next race he partakes in. Now, this to me says that it's the sprint in Miami, um, but obviously there's a little bit of confusion at the moment about whether that's the sprint or the Grand Prix. Um, and he got that penalty because he overtook Hulkenberg under the safety car to regain the position that Hulkenberg took from him during his crash with Stroll. So as the crash kind of happened on like the left-hand side of the track... Hulkenberg was able to stay a little bit close to the apex and get past the situation with Lance and Daniel I and mean, obviously gain two places in doing so. Um, and it's a little bit dodgy in the, under the regulations. So Daniel was given the penalty as a breach of Article 55.8 of the regulations, which says no driver may overtake another car on the track during the safety car. Now, I think that's fair enough because everything was kind of moving normally again then. And Daniel sort of took the position back thinking, you know, he was owed that because he did nothing wrong in that crash. Now, Nico didn't get a penalty for overtaking Daniel and Stroll because there's a part of the regulations that say you're able to overtake under the safety car if there's an obvious problem. Now, it kind of begs the question whether getting hit by a car behind is an obvious problem. Um, I mean, yeah, I, again, it's up to the stewards really in that situation and up to their judgment whether that counts as... An obvious problem. Um, what do you think? Do you, do you think that's an obvious problem or? Um, to me, I think the regulation specifically says the car in front has an obvious problem. Now to me, having an obvious problem is not that you've just been hit in the rear by the car behind you. It's that you've got a mechanical fault or you've got some damage that's ending your race and that happens to be happening under the safety car. It's not related to an incident or it's that sort of, it's just happening on its own, but it happens to be under the safety car. You're pulling off to one side and the drivers are going around you because you're slowing. Um, but again, I think this highlights the ambiguity in the regulations. Now, what you could say, you could obviously then specify in the regulations what is an obvious problem, being hit, being having a mechanical fault or, you know, so on and so on. But obviously then there would be exceptions to that. It's again, that specificity, the complexity of the sport. You can't, put a clause suggesting every single thing that could possibly happen you'd be there for ages it would be infinite um with the way this sport seems to go sometimes um but to me that's what that suggests obviously I'm not a steward and they've taken that to to mean that and I think what they perhaps mean instead and perhaps would be better wording was that he was taking avoiding action Nico was avoiding becoming a third car fourth car in that crash he pulled out of the way fair enough um they've just had to kind of slot that in under obvious problem. Yeah, I think as well, something to add to the situation is when Daniel overtook Nico again, you could probably kind of raise the issue of safety that if he had, because he didn't really have a good reason to overtake Hulkenberg other than sort of taking that position back. Um, and I think that you could 
argue that, okay, maybe there might have been something going on on the track that Daniel might not have seen. There's a reason the safety car is out. He probably shouldn't have overtaken. And then the penalty seems fair enough. But then again, you can look at it from the angle that Daniel didn't do anything wrong to lose that place. So he should rightfully have that place. But maybe the team would have been better to appeal that after the safety car period and swap back on the track. Um, again, it's just a, such a difficult situation to judge, really. Definitely. I think perhaps they didn't do that because it was all such heat of the moment. I think the team was disappointed by what had just happened as well. And it was all just a bit up in the air at that, well, literally <laughs> at that point. Um, OK, so the other uh, the other incident that we saw was between Yuki Tsunoda and Kevin Magnussen. Not a great time out there for the V-Carbs uh, this weekend. Yuki had been struggling all weekend. Daniel had beaten him, I think, in all sessions so far that weekend. Um the team had checked the entire car, they couldn't find anything obvious, but perhaps there was something wrong with it, or it was a setup choice. That just meant that the tyres perhaps struggled in that strange grip that we've spoken about. Um, in the race then, though, Yuki got hit by Magnussen at the same safety car restart as uh, Daniel's issue, and that's uh, and that caused him a puncture to his rear tyre and made him spin out and he DNF'd. Kevin again got a 10 second penalty and two points for this that seems to be the default penalty at the moment uh because he braked late and so was predominantly to blame i think this perhaps brings us on to the kind of wider discussion of the baseline penalties in f1 at the moment so they've introduced this year that the baseline penalty is 10 seconds which is kind of the new five second penalty we saw last year five second penalties getting handed out left right and center um and obviously they don't cause too much disruption to a race for a driver who's just caused an incident or ended another driver's race or what have you. Um, so do you think it's a good thing perhaps that they've changed this to 10 seconds or are we seeing the same problem just at a, a kind of more severe level now that it's 10 seconds, not five? I think the use of the 10 seconds is better, but I don't think they should be afraid to still use five seconds because there's time where five se times where five seconds is a bit more reasonable. Um, I think maybe even in that Magnuson situation, I probably would have given Magnuson a five second. I feel like that's mm. a little bit more, um, the penalty fits the crime, if you like. Um, yeah. But the thing that worries me is about the penalty points. They seem to also be handing out penalty points more than I've ever seen before. Um, and I, I do wonder if we're actually going to see maybe some drivers get a ban. Um, I think some drivers were on eight penalty points at the moment. And if they're handing out two per incident, then... I mean, for some drivers, not naming any names, that's going to be two more incidents and they're banned. So I think, yeah, it's something that maybe needs to be looked at because some issues I don't think deserve penalty points, but yet they're still handing them out and that's going to cause a problem if there's a maximum of 12 at one time for each driver. OK, so on to the rest of the grid now. Uh, again, starting with another penalty, strangely enough, uh, for Alpine. They received today a €10,000 fine for having an unsafe pit stop. That was a bit of a strange situation. Um, just to quickly explain, if you didn't see, Gasly was shown the green light so that he could move off, supposedly at the end of his pit stop, but the right rear tyre wasn't on the car properly. A team member also, according to the FIA and the stewards, incorrectly clicked the button to release the car, which is what turned the light green. They did stop the car again once they'd realised and the light went red, but in that wheel coming off uh, at the right rear and knocked down a team member apparently they were fine they've suffered some light injuries but they carried on their duties for the rest of the race and they were okay luckily um but because Gasly went when it was green and then stopped again when it was red they, they decided that it wasn't his fault for kind of going prematurely and therefore find the team for having unsafe pit stop process but beyond that I think Alpine looked stronger this weekend uh, would you agree with that and why might they be looking stronger yeah, it was definitely a better weekend for Alpine than we've seen so far this season. Obviously, Ocon was almost in the points in P11, and he did have an upgraded floor, um, which didn't really pay off until the race, but clearly it's been a huge improvement um, to get to P11 in the first place. Gasly will get this new floor in uh, Miami, so it'll be interesting to see if he has a jump in performance as well. But yeah, definitely overall uh, a better weekend for Alpine, and I'm sure they're going to be feeling good about this Um especially where they were at the start of the season. And if they can keep this momentum, I'm sure we'll see them pick up their first points of the season very soon. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think it was a much better weekend for Alpine this weekend, obviously both on paper, but also in terms of the car. I think those upgrades were clearly working and it'll be interesting to see what they can do in Miami with those on Pierre's car as well. Another team bringing upgrades to Miami, according to their team principal Toto Wolff, is Mercedes. Um, 
Bit of a funny weekend on George's side. I felt like we didn't really see him much on the TV feed. He was on his own for most of the race, I think. He started in P8 and finished in P6. But he said post-race that he thinks that is just where they are for right now. So he wasn't too worried about um, perhaps the lack of performance or just the performance generally this weekend. Um, and he also said that all the cars sort of fell into car pace order and he sort of feels like that is representative of where the Mercedes is currently. Lewis, on the other hand, had a bit of a tale of two halves this weekend with the sprint and then the Grand Prix. He was P2 uh, on the grid for the sprint. He almost had that sprint pole um, had it not been for Lando's lap being reinstated. And the weather, I think, really helped him there. The car, the Mercedes really likes those cold, wet conditions. And obviously that played to the strengths of the car. Um, and Lewis obviously has great experience around Shanghai and also in wet weather um, that he was able to draw on to put in that performance. But then come the Grand Prix qualifying and the race, he qualified in P18 and was able to recover to P9, which again, as George said, perhaps is just where that car pace was. We, we know they made changes outside of Park Fermi between the sprint and quali as part of some of these experiments that, that they're doing. Do you think that probably affected Lewis's ability to A, qualify well, and then also B, to get up to sort of P6, P7 around where George was? Yeah, I think the experiments are definitely affecting his performance. Obviously, we had the Park Fermi reopening after the sprint, so they were able to make some setup changes there. And maybe they did head slightly more in the wrong direction if they were playing around with the car a bit. Toto has said that he knows the car is not good enough overall. Um, and so they're, they're probably using Lewis because he's leaving as more of a guinea pig to test these um, car setups than they are George. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that his performances are being affected by these experiments. But I think probably for Mercedes, it's the right move. But it's just probably a little bit tough on Lewis at the moment. Okay, moving on to steak. Obviously, an incredibly special weekend and a special day today for Joe. It was his first home race, and it was very emotional at the end, I think, to see how much this meant to him to have, A, the opportunity to race at home, but then B, to be able to pull up his car uh, in Park Firm at the, at the end of the race on the grid and be able to just hear that roar of the fans for him. Um, I kind of feel like that was a bit reflective of his his dream to get to that point, uh, you know, he was in those crowds 20 years ago and now he's on the grid and they're all cheering for him. Um, he had a, a good weekend, I think, up until perhaps the race, unfortunately. He finished in P9 just outside the points in the sprint. The race was slightly harder. He started in P16, ended in P14. But I don't think the performance will be the main focus for him. I think it will be the support that he had from the crowd and just the experience of uh, the whole home weekend overall. Exactly. I think it was a moment that really showed the power of the sport. And I wonder how many people in that crowd are hoping that that's going to be them one day um, and are going to be pushing and karting and stuff to try and get to the same level as Joe is. I think it's obviously a hugely inspiring moment for everybody who saw it um, and a, a very emotional moment for Joe himself. Um, and I think it was really nice that he was able to pull up his car mm. on the grid rather than just sort of waving from the, the pit lane because so many people have probably paid to come and see him and support him, that it was nice for him to be able to give a bit of a gesture back to them and say thank you. On the other side of the garage at stake, it was a little bit of a tougher day for Bottas. He had a retirement because of an engine failure. Um, perhaps something to keep an eye on in relation to the Ferrari engine, but his weekend had been really promising to that point. He had some really good battles with Daniel Ricciardo during the sprint, and he finished that in P12, and he qualified for the race in P10. He's been hovering around that P12 to P10 spot all weekend. So that's good to see on a, on a pace point of view as well. On a team point of view, they finally had some consistent pit stops. Um, their team representative, Alessandro Aluni Bravi, saying that they met the target that they set themselves. I think at one point I saw they did a three second stop. Obviously, they did more than just one stop. I didn't notice what the times were for the other ones, but they weren't the 30 seconds that we've seen previously. Yeah. I'm a bit sad for Stake to be leaving this weekend without any points because I think they've looked so strong in both the sprint and the race. They were looking quite good. Um, and they've really taken a step. I'm not sure what they've done. Um, they didn't have upgrades. No. Um, but yeah, they seem to gain some pace from somewhere. It was quite impressive, really. So yeah, I, I think it's a bit of a shame that they w came away from the weekend with a retirement, and obviously P14 is not too bad, but um, I really feel like they should have been in the points this weekend. Yeah, they were definitely the best of the rest, I think, this weekend. Uh, on to our final team, Williams. Uh 
bit of a tough weekend for Logan, a uh, driver a bit under pressure at the moment, you could argue. Um, he had a pit lane start for the Grand Prix. After qualifying in P20, the team decided to make some changes to his front wing and nose, his rear wing gurney and his suspension setup during Park Ferme, which obviously meant he started in the pit lane. He ended in P17, which was net last after the DNF. So not the kind of weekend Logan really needed, given this pressure he's under at the moment to perform. It's his second season in the sport. He's had a difficult start to the season, to be fair. He had to give up his car. He's had a lot of crashes and he had another spin this weekend during qualifying, saying that the car was really on edge. Um, another 10 second penalty receiver um, and two penalty points for overtaking under the safety car. Can you explain a little bit about what happened there? And do you think that was a fair penalty? Do you think that he needed a penalty at all? Yeah. So again, it was another kind of strange penalty because Nico Hulkenberg was coming out of the pits and obviously you have the safety car line um, across the track as and Logan's coming down the main straight and they sort of meet at that line at about the same time. But I don't think either of them could see each other. So they weren't really sure who was ahead of who. Um, and I mean, again, it's a difficult one because neither of them can see the safety car line so they don't know if they're overtaking the other. And I feel like maybe... Sh um, I feel like maybe Logan should have had priority because he's on the main track. Um, mm. But you can see in one shot that uh, Nico Hulkenberg is slightly ahead of Stroll, uh, slightly ahead of Sargent and does touch that line first. But obviously neither driver really knew, so they weren't sure what to do. So maybe it was something that really needs to be addressed sort of over the radio and just, okay, give the place back. He was behind you or he was ahead of you rather than penalising them. I think it's a little bit unfair. These cars are so difficult to see out of anyway. How are you expected to see exactly where another car is on a line going 200 mile an hour? You know, I think it's a little bit difficult and I think the penalty was probably quite unfair because of that. Yeah, I think along that line, I wonder how Logan, how the stewards expected Logan to not overtake. Logan's coming yeah. down that, yes, he's under the safety car, but they're still doing quite high speeds at that point at the end of the main straight how is Logan expected to stop when he's like 15 centimeters away from the line is yeah. he was supposed to slam on at that point he's probably gone around him anyway I think perhaps maybe they were getting at the point that he kept the position instead of giving it back and again perhaps at the communication from the team perhaps there should have been a bit of you're going to be with um, Nico Hulkenberg at pit exit you know let him go kind of th situation they can see that coming obviously the team um, on the GPS so maybe that's what the stewards are getting at I kind of feel like if they were getting at that give the team a fine for communication as we've seen with kind of um, track position and stuff previously exactly but it also brings up the problem that if if Sergeant was to have given the place back then would he have had a penalty or would Nico have had a penalty for overtaking under yeah. the safety car it brings up another problem there you know it it's, goes it's on like forever yeah. yeah no definitely and I think Aside from that, though, just a tough weekend for Logan generally. Alex had a bit of a better weekend. He started in P14, ended in P12. He said that the tyre performance was really strange. He said that they'd come out of the pits, do a couple of corners, and the performance would be fine. And then it would be gone for the rest of the stint after that point, even on the first kind of outlap after his pit stop. Um, but he did say that they know where the problems are with the car, but this isn't something that they can fix short term the problems they've identified this weekend and they'll need upgrades, which obviously, as we know, is going to take time, given the bit of chassis problem that they're having. Speaking of chassis, though, they will have one in Miami, I believe, uh, their third chassis. So they're back uh, able to perhaps push a little bit harder now, knowing that they have that to fall back on. Yeah, I'm sure James Vowles will give a sigh of relief when, he, uh, yeah. when they have that third chassis because, yeah, it's obviously... They're walking on a thin line every race in case somebody has a crash. You know, how do they respond to that? So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they'll be glad to have that third chassis in the, in the in their back pocket. Definitely. Also, home race for Logan next time out in Miami. So he'll be hoping things go a little bit better um, than they did this weekend. Absolutely. So that's our analysis of the Chinese Grand Prix. A bit of an incident and penalty filled race this weekend. Join us next time out for Miami where we'll have another sprint weekend to analyse. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a rating and follow the show and join us next time for more of the latest in the F1 world.